thank you so much. The song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, wonderful song. I appreciate the emphasis the preacher put on it. Brother Kilpatrick, who wrote that song, uh, was in a meeting where the soloist that was being used every night wasn't a Christian. He wasn't saved. Uh, beautiful voice, did a good job. Uh, I mean, just a, a wonderful job in singing the song. But the Kilpatrick said, you know, I sure would like to see that man become a Christian. So in the meeting, he wrote a song entitled, Lord, I'm Coming Home. And he said to that soloist, he said, I want you to sing this song during this meeting, if you will. And so the soloist said, I will. And so he got up that night in front of that big crowd, and he began to sing that song, Lord, I'm Coming Home. And the Holy Spirit moved in his heart during the course of that song and before the song was over the man knelt his knees and gave his heart to Christ Brother Kilpatrick tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Lord I'm coming home God has used these songwriters down through the years to help the cause of Christ to help bring people to Christ and strengthen Christians and etc and I'm so so pleased when we get into a church like this it still use the old timey hymns I, I just, Brother Gary and I were talking before the service about some of the churches who've gone the other direction, and I've said this to you before, but let me say it again for those who didn't hear it. I was in a, I was in a service here, well, there was a boy, a man, a, <laughs> he was a man, but <laughs> a great big guy, who had been after me for several years to come preach for him, and I just didn't have an opening. So finally one day, I said to him, look, I'm going to be going from point A to point B, and I've got to come by your place. And if I can get the preacher at point B to release me on Sunday morning, I'll stop by your place and I'll preach Sunday morning. That's the best I can do. If he'll release me, then I'll, I'll preach at your place on Sunday morning. So he said, that would be okay. So I called that preacher and he said, that would be fine. You start with me Sunday night. So I stopped there on Sunday morning and a uh, beautiful church building. I'm telling you, it was gorgeous. I, the lawn was manicured. Uh, when the crowd began to come, good mixture of age groups, children and teenagers and older Christians and young couples and so forth and so on. And, I, and you could just feel the energy, and I thought, wow, this is going to be a great, great, great meeting. So I was excited about being there and uh, went into Sunday school, and he had a missionary speaking there in Sunday school, and uh, the missionary used something different than the King James. And I thought, uh-oh. I said, now that probably slipped in on that guy. And I said, when we go to lunch, I'll talk to him and tell him how to, how to handle that the next time. And so anyway, time for the service. And uh, we're standing there, and the, the song leader said, all right, praise team, come on to the, come on to the platform. Well, I'm not going to be quick to judge because you people call things different names and, you know, and... And so here they came, and they came up on the platform, and I'm telling you, the screen came down, and the projector came on, and nothing wrong with those two things at all, but, uh, but they sang for about 40 minutes, and I say they, because at that time, I'd been saved about 41 years, and I did not know not one song that they sang. I mean, they sung, and they sung, and they sung for 40 minutes, and I just stood there. I looked for a book. I couldn't find a book, and... And, uh, of course, it wouldn't have mattered because I had it all up on the screen anyway. But I thought, well, that's not in that book, I'm sure. I don't know those songs. So anyway, at the end of the service, uh, we had a good service. I preached and people came to the altar and so forth. But at the end of the service, he and I went out to eat. And I said, Brother, I said, uh, you know, you've been trying to get me to come preach a revival for you for a number of years. And I said, if I had an opening, I wouldn't come. I said, because I'd end up hurting you. He said, how's that? I said, well... I said, you've done your people a real disservice. I said, you have taken the songbook out of their hands. And the songbook is full of doctrine. The doctrine of faith, heaven, hell, the blood, the deity of Christ. So, I mean, it's full of doctrine. And you've taken that out of their hands and you have put in their hands cotton candy. Tastes good, but it doesn't last long. There's no, there's no substance to it. It's, it's, it, it doesn't do anything for you. 
It's there and it's gone. I said, I said, when people go to the hospital, they need what a friend we have in Jesus. Yeah. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. So I said, even if I had an opening, I wouldn't, I wouldn't come because uh, inevitably because of who I am. Not because on purpose, but I, I'm, that's who I am. I would say something along those lines and it ended up hurting you, so it would be best for me to stay away. So I like coming to places where you use the old time hymns. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm not against new songs as long as they got some substance, as long as they say something. I mean, I'm not against new at all. But, uh, but anyway, uh, thank God for old timey churches that still believe in singing. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I tell you, I love it, I love it, I love it. Uh, tell you about the three guys who went off to a big city for a big convention and and they ended up staying on the 75th floor of a hotel. Went to the convention, went out to eat afterward. When they got back to the hotel, the elevators were out of, out of operation. It wouldn't, wouldn't operate. So they've got to walk 75 floors. They decided what they'd do. They, the first 25 floors, one guy would sing some songs, and that helped pass the time. Next 25 floors, and the guy would tell some jokes, and that would help pass the time. Third 25 floors, the guy would tell some sad stories. <clears throat> so first 25 floors, they sung a few songs. Went pretty good. Next 25 floors, told some jokes. That went pretty good. Got on the 51st floor, and the guy who's going to tell the sad story said, Boys, he said, I've left the motel key down in the rental car. <laughs> That's a sad story. <laughs> now, the reason I bring that up is because I, I talk with Christians all over the country, and to be honest with you, a lot of folk have forgotten who we are and what God wants to do with and through us, and, and what they have is sad stories. Well, preacher, this is a hard area. You know how it is. And I have to be honest and say, no, I really don't know how it is because the gospel is still the same. Amen. Sinners are still the same. The power of God is still the same. If you want to talk about a hard area, talk about Paul going to the city of Ephesus. <laughs> Highly educated town, idolatrous town, sports-minded town. People by the thousands would come there to... And, and, and Paul and a group of people turned the world upside down Amen. in just three and a half years. Others say, I'm telling you, you know, it's just people just don't want to be saved anymore. People don't want to come to church anymore. I just don't believe any of that. I think those are sad, sad stories. Yes. Now, I realize you can get to the place that, that when you look around, you think we're on the losing side. I, I know if you... See, a young girl who's been raised in a Christian home, a godly home, if you see her turn her back on all of her teaching and training and go off and marry some unsaved boy and ruin her life, you think to yourself, I'm telling you, Satan is winning this war. Or if you see a young boy get out of God's will, I, I'm thinking of a young boy now, raised in a godly home, I mean a a wonderful home, and, and, and when he was 12, 13, 14, 15 years of old age, just a, just a good old country boy. I mean, just polite and, and loved church and loved his daddy and loved working on the farm, and, and what a blessing he was for me to be around. And then all of a sudden, he falls in love with this girl, and she is everything that, 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 that a Christian mom and dad would not want their boy to get tangled up with. I won't go into all kind of description of her, but I mean, just looking at her, she, she was nothing like you would ever dream of your son getting tangled up with. And, and off he went with her, and, and they ended up running away and getting married, and, and they had a child, and the mom and dad did the right thing. They welcomed that girl into the home and, and tried to help win her to Christ, and she pretended for a while to be a Christian, and then... Pretty soon the boy and the girl ended up divorcing and the boy who had been raised by godly parents to do right and to be right ended up on drugs 
ended up homeless, sleeping on the streets under the bridge. And when I went to talk with him, I shook my head and I said, Son, how in this world did you end up in this shape being raised in the home that you've been raised up in? And when you see things like that, you just you, you, you shake your head and you, and you get discouraged and you think, I'm telling you, it just looks like Satan is winning this thing. Seems like no matter how you train them and what happens, they're going to go there on the way anyway. Or, or a young couple, I, I've told you this story before. I had a young couple in my church years ago. Uh, I called him Smiley. He was a handsome fellow, always smiling, friendly, friendly guy, beautiful wife and, and, and three wonderful little old daughters. And, and, and he worked our bus ministry and those little daughters, they puppy dogged him everywhere. They loved their daddy. Everywhere he went, they went. And, and, and he loved those girls. And I mean, it just looked like an ideal home. They, they both sang in the choir and the, they were all involved in Sunday school and all the other things. And, and, and then I began to watch the devil begin to weasel his way into that home and, and you could see the friction and you could see the lack of love. And, and I went to them and tried to work with them and talk with them and they just kept getting further and further apart. And, and uh, pretty soon... After the girls have gotten on up 12, 13 years of age, the mom and daddy are in the middle of a divorce. And I remember going even to the courthouse to try to talk them out of it. They're going to have a trial. And, and, and I went to the courthouse to beg both of them, don't go through with this. This is, this is wrong. God can, God can save your marriage. God can put the honey back in the honeymoon. Please don't go through with this. And so I'm standing on the balcony on this side of the courthouse and the girls with their mother standing on the other side of the courthouse on the balcony over there. And those girls were screaming across that, across that room, we hate you, saying it to their daddy. We hate you. And went on and on. And I stood there and I thought, Lord, it just looks like sometimes Satan is winning I mean, godly home. And by the way, don't, don't put yourself above that. He can get into your home and, and do what he wants to in your home if you, if you don't stay close to him and, and let Jesus solve your problems and so forth. Amen. But I'm just saying, I, listen, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll get to the place that you've, you look at situations like that and you think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it just looks like we're on the losing side. Now, one of my favorite songs, I think you all sing it here, is I'm on the winning side. I'm on the winning side. Matter of fact, and I've told you this, I've got a preacher friend in Wilmington, North Carolina, that he turned to the very end of the book, book of Revelation, the last chapter, and he wrote in big bold letters, we win. <laughs> so I've copied that. I've got that at the end of mine to remind me that, that, that we are God's people. And we're more, listen, listen, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. If God be for us, who can be against us? With that in mind, turn to Ephesians chapter 6, if you will, please. I want to remind you tonight of who you are. Now, last night we talked about impacting people's lives and, and God using us to, uh, to help bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ and and, uh, and, and, and I want to remind you tonight, I didn't say it last night, but I want you to understand God does not expect you to win anybody to Christ with your own personality or abilities. I mean, uh, you have to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God. Can you say amen to that? It's not dependent upon how knowledgeable I am or how uh, smooth I am or how likable I am. I, listen, none of that has anything to do with it. I mean, it's just wonderful if you've got a good personality, but, uh, but it's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But Ephesians chapter 6, for those who can and will, if you'll stand with us, please, for the reading of the word tonight. Our Lord is reminding us that every boy and girl, man and woman, grandmother, granddaddy, husband, wife, every person who belongs to Him, can make a difference in this world. He can use us to make a difference. Now, he tells us in verse 10, 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now, there you go. See, that's the secret of it right there. We've got to remember who we are and, and that His power, and when we're surrendered to Him and allow Him, His power will help us make a difference in our, in our society. So be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to watch this to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now we can stand. We can make a difference. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take anew the whole armor of God. Watch it, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Do you think we're living in an evil day? God says we can stand. And having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench, <laughs> I like it, all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching there and too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Now it doesn't stop there. It goes on. You read later if you will please. Thank you so much. You may be seated. But, but, but I want you to, to from, from this passage of scripture. I want you to take away from it the fact that, that, that God has told us as a girl, a boy, a man, a woman. He has told us how to win the battle against evil. Now, again, I, and maybe you're not this way, but, but I'm around a lot of folk that they'll watch a television program. The television program is quite filthy and so forth, and they'll just suck their breath and say, isn't that horrible? And that's the end of it. Don't do anything about it. And as a result of that kind of attitude, then, then evil is is sweeping our land. I'm, I'm seeing things I never dreamed that I would see when I was a boy. I'm telling you what's the truth. I mean, I, and you know it. I'm not, I'm not going to stay long on this because I've got a whole different direction I want to go. But, uh, but when I was a boy, you just did not hear of the sodomites except that they were quiet about it. I remember I worked out on 12th Street. And in that area there was some and, and occasionally one would come out of the shadows and, 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 and approach me or approach my brother or whatever. And, 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 and when we would say, hey, you get out of here, then they'd slink back to where they came from. But it just wasn't any. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, though, that, was, that was just wasn't heard of. But now it's an agenda. The programming and the newspapers and, and I mean, all type of entertainment is, is, is trying to make us think that that is common, that that's normal. And they'll tell you that those people were, were born that way and they have no choice about it whatsoever. Now, that's just not the truth. It's just not the truth at all, I'm telling you. I mean, uh, they, they were born with a sin nature. There's no question about that. But sin will make you choose to be this or that or the other. And homosexuality or, or, or the sodomite, sodom, uh, sodomite lifestyle is, is just another choice. And, and thank God, it's a, it's a choice where you can, you can choose to get out of it. And God, <laughs> God set you free from that kind of lifestyle. I've told this little story before. A lady had said to me, Preacher, would you make a visit for me at Greater Hospital? And I said, I'd be glad to. She told me the room number, told me the floor and the guy's name. And then she said, now you may not want to go when I tell you why he's there. And I said, well, I don't know of anything you could tell me that would make me want to try to go win somebody to Christ. She said, well, he's, uh, she called him a homosexual and said he has AIDS. And I said, well, Jesus loves homosexuals, and yes, sir. he loves people with AIDS. Amen. 
She said, well, I'm glad you're going to go see him. So I drove to Grady Hospital, went to the floor, down to the room, went into the room, and there he is, and he's probably in his 30s, mid to, mid to late 30s, and, and his eyes are sunken back in his head. He's, 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 just, a, he, he's just skin and bones. That, the AIDS have taken their toll on his body. And I went into the room and introduced myself to him, and I said, I've come to talk to you about Christ. And he said, sir, I'm sorry you've wasted your time. He said, uh, I, I can't be saved. And I said, oh, why, why do you feel you can't be saved? He said, don't you know what I am? I said, yeah, I understand you're a sodomite. And he said, I can't be saved. And I said, well, let me, let me, let me, let me clear something up for you. I said, I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation several times, and not one time in all of my reading have I ever found God saying that the sodomite cannot be saved. As a matter of fact, he says the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he names specific sins. But then he goes into the next verse and says, And such were some of you, but now you're washed and now you're clean. And now you're... And, and, and he said, let me see that. And so I took my testament and turned it around to him. And he said, do you mean to tell me that I, God can save me? I said, wash your sins away just like that. I said, not two steps to, not three steps to, not seven keys to. I mean, boom, you go from being a, a sinner to a child of God. He said that I'm ready. The boy with tears running down his face, that man asked Christ into his heart and life. When he quit praying, I said, what about it? He said, boy, it feels good. The burden of sin is gone and I feel clean. And, and so I reached down in the bed and pulled him up next to me and I said, let me hug you and, and be the first to welcome you into the family of God and call you brother. Yes, sir. He said, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. He said, go down to the waiting room. My family's in the waiting room. Tell them, come up here. I want to tell them something. So they came up to the waiting, uh, came up to the room there and they walked in and he said, with a big old grin, he said, now a few minutes ago I was headed to hell. He said, but I want to tell you something. I'm headed to heaven now. Jesus Christ saved me. And he said, I want each one of you to meet me there. <laughs> yeah, listen. I, I'm just saying to you, if, if you're not careful, you, you, we lose sight of the fact that, 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 that though Satan is strong and, and though he's roaring and though, though sin is sweeping our country, God has put us here as light and salt to make a difference, to help, to help stop that. And, and if we will surrender as a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, if we will surrender to God to, to help those that, that, are, that are in darkness and, and in need of Christ to stand in their way, then I'm telling you we can make a difference in people's lives. Amen. You see, people are, bound by, people are bound by sin. But they need somebody like us to show them the way. People are bound by, by religion. I'm listen, religion is one of, the, one, of the, one of the worst things in the world you can ever be bound by. He's talking about winning the fellow to Christ that, that from India. I remember preaching in India some years ago, and, and, and I'd heard these stories of, of folk going there and having the large crusades and thousands being saved. But I soon learned why some of those crusades had so many professions of faith. Because you see, in India, they worship over one million gods. The river, the, the monkey, the snake, the, the, the rat, the cow, and, and, and on and on and on. I mean, all of these are their gods. And, 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 and if you say, if you say in, in your preaching, if you give an invitation, if you say to them, how many of you would like to come and receive Christ as your Savior? You'll have thousands to walk the aisle. Because what they're going to do is just add him on. He's just another God. Just going to add him on. So when I preached in India, I would say to them, listen, how many of you are willing to turn your back upon your idols, your false gods, and come to the one and true and living God Amen. and make him Lord and Master? How many will rise from your seats? and Then you're down to hundreds, not thousands. Amen. But religion is... It, 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 Binds you. It, it 
change you. I, I remember going into a woman's house some years ago back in the 70s and, and she was of another denomination and she heard that I was coming a Baptist preacher and, and, and so she was going to set me straight. She'd already made it up in her mind that when I walked in her home that, that she was going to have her little book out, her little prayer book out and, and, and she's going to shoot straight with me and, and tell me why I shouldn't be a Baptist and, and why she was who she was and, and, and so I knocked on her door and she said come in and she's sitting in the middle of the chair in the middle of the room there in the chair had her arms crossed grinning real big she said come on in preacher so I went on in and she said you know I'm not a Baptist don't you I said yes ma'am I know that I said what are you she told me and I said well let me let me ask you tell me a little bit about that so she began to tell me in glowing terms about what she was, the, the type of religion she was in, and, and how thrilled she was to be a part of it, and she'd been raised up in it. She said, I was confirmed at age 12. I said, well, tell me a little bit about the confirmation. And she told me about that, and she was so excited and thrilled about it. And, 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 and so when she finished up, I said, well, let me ask you one final question. I said, do you think that's enough to carry you to heaven? And boy, tears began to stream down her face. And she said, no, sir. I said, so you're not satisfied that that's enough? She said, I'm not. Could you tell me what to do? <laughs> and so the Baptist preacher took God's book and showed her what to do to be saved. And, and, and she became a born-again believer. Her and her husband came active in our church. Now, now, from time to time, she would say to me jokingly, you've ruined my life. I said, why? She said, because since I've left my denomination, they have begun to ordain women preachers, and I could have been a woman preacher. You've ruined my life. And I'd heard that over and over and over and over. So finally one Sunday night, I said to the audience after the service is over, I said, would you please sit down just a moment. I got one other item I need to take care of. I said, from time to time, we ordain deacons. From time to time, we ordain pastors. And I said, I need to ordain somebody tonight. I had a styrofoam cup with her name on it. I had taken a... Certificate of ordination that was supposed to be for deacons and I struck all that out and I put her name on it. And I said, uh, would you please come forward? <laughs> and she came forward. She is red. She is glowing red. <laughs> she walks to the platform. I said, now here's your ordination paper. It don't mean a thing. Go on and don't ever mention it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> I said, go preach. Do what you're going to do. But... Uh, but she'd been bound by that religion. Now that was in 1970-something. Well, here about two weeks ago, I'm in the Publix store up above my house there. And I'm over in the vegetable department and I'm shopping and I heard my name, Brother Hayes! Brother Hayes! And I turned to look and, and I look and there she was. It's the lady I just told you the story about. And there she is. Has her granddaughter about 11 or 12 years of age with her and and, and I walk over and I said, well, it's so good to see you. How in the world are you doing? She said, I'm, I'm doing fine. She said, what's, what's ironic? She said, just yesterday I was telling my granddaughter about the day that you came to my home and led me to Christ. And the granddaughter's face lit up and she said, you're the man that helped my grandmother become a Christian. Said so she was just telling me yesterday the joy that's in her soul. She was bound by religion, but no peace. Some of you have friends. They bound by, I mean, the, the religion that makes you do and you do and you, and you do and you do. And it's never enough. And you ne you, it's never done. And, 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 and you keep doing and you keep doing it. And you never get what you want. But see, listen, Christ paid it all. It's done. It's finished when Christ died on the cross. And, and, but, but God has put us in our family's lives so as we can defeat the devil and help set these folk free. Stand. Be salt. Be light. Defeat the enemy. 
We don't have to watch our families go to hell. Some years ago, I was teaching here in Atlanta in a college, and, and uh, my class was made up of preachers and deacons and Sunday school teachers and, and Christian workers and had a class of about 30 people. And, and I remember after about two months of teaching, I just had a sense of, of, of maybe that a lot of the people in there weren't Christians. They were Christian workers, but they weren't Christians. So one night I came in before this class and I leaned up against the desk and I watched folk come in and file in and, and they got their books and I said, turn, turn, close your books and, and uh, just look up this way. I want to talk to you a little bit. And so I began to talk to those preachers and deacons and Sunday school teachers and Christian workers and I said, I want to tell you how to be saved. I said, I know you're Christian workers and all, but I want to tell you what it takes to become a Christian. And I talked to them about that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that there's none righteous and no, not one. And, 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 and I went on and talked about baptism and, and, and church membership and turning over a new leaf. None of that does the job. And, 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 I, and I said to them, listen, I'm telling you that if you've never had a, a born-again experience, if you never realized yourself lost and, and saw yourself on the way to hell and asked Christ into your heart and life, there is no salvation. I don't care if you're a preacher or a deacon or whatever. I'm telling you, you have to have, you have to have the new birth. So I spent about 20 minutes going through that, and I said, now bow your heads. And they bowed their heads, and I said, now let me ask you, based upon what I've just said, how many of you in the room would lift your hand and say, preacher, I'm not a Christian, I've never been saved? Well, 13 hands went up. I thought they misunderstood. I said, put your hands down. I said, let me ask you the question again. I said, how many in this room, based upon what I've just, what I, what I've just said, have never had the new birth experience, and if you died tonight, you'd go to hell. Would you lift your hand? Thirteen hands went up. I said, put your hands down. I said, open your eyes. Look this way just a minute. So they're looking at me. I said, if you believe that you're lost and on your way to hell and you want to get saved tonight, get up from your seat, come here and kneel around me here at this desk. And all thirteen folk got up and preachers and deacons and preachers' wives and teachers and 13 precious souls cried out to the Lord that night. They were bound by Satan. But God in His mercy chose to use somebody like me to help to help set them free. Listen, I'm telling you, Satan is powerful, but he's not, <laughs> he's not all powerful. Listen, I'm telling you, I, I, if, if we will surrender ourselves to God, I, I'm telling you, we can go into Satan's territory and, and we, can, we, can, we, can, we can watch God do a mighty work upon, upon uh, that family member or that, that co-worker or that neighbor. We can watch God do, if we will allow God to, if we'll take and, and, uh, the armor of God and do what we have and stand then we can defeat the enemy. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I was preaching on 13th Street out here years ago and, and uh, used to go on Friday night to the Plaza Park and preach there at Plaza Park. On Saturday night, I'd go down to the hippie district down in 12th, 13th Street and so forth. The hippies were real bountiful back then. And, and, uh, and we'd get in the midst of those, and I'm telling you, we had some times. I, God, really, we saw a lot of folk get saved. We, we, put, we put kids on buses and sent them back to California and sent them back to Colorado and, and where they'd get saved and go back home to mama and daddy and so forth and so on. But, but, but had this one girl, just one beautiful girl, I'm telling you, strikingly beautiful. It just looked like there wasn't a flaw on her. Her, her smile was was just dazzling in her hair and, and her skin. I mean, just a, just a beautiful, beautiful girl. And I'll use this terminology for you adults. But she was the playmate for a motorcycle gang. I mean, she was just the playmate for all of the, all of the boys. And I'm preaching down there and trying to be get into the enemy's territory and, and reach in there and try to defeat Satan. And, because again, I realize that God 
using a surrendered person, listen, is greater than whatever Satan can do. God can use us to undo it. And I'm preaching and she's making fun. She's jeering and making fun and jeering and making fun. And finally, the Holy Ghost of God took something and, and penetrated her heart and, 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 and she began to cry and she came over to me and she said, please stop, she said, please stop. She said, I want you to tell me what to do to be saved. I said, now what a go, you were making fun. What's going on? She said, I don't know what's happening, but I got to get saved. And there on the corner of Peachtree and 13th Street, that beautiful young lady bowed her knees and asked Christ to become her Lord and Savior. I had her come to our church several times after I began to pastor and give a testimony of what God had done in her life. I'm telling you, listen, I'm just saying to you that according to what I read in Ephesians chapter 6, Satan does not have to play havoc in your family. He doesn't have to play havoc in your church. He, 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 he can be stood against. He can, he can be resisted. He can, he can be defeated, thank God. He can be defeated. I, again, he said, take on the armor of God and and uh, and 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 and, and he, I've watched God use little boys and girls. I've watched him use teenagers. I've watched him use moms and dads, grandparents, who just say, well, now, you know, Satan is raging, but I'm telling you, he don't have to, he don't have to be the winner. I'm just going to resist him. And watch God do mighty things in that family. You've heard my story. Let me just tell it in brief. When I was being raised as a boy, my mom and daddy were divorced. Well, separated off and on, off and on until I was 12 and a half years of age. And then they finally called it quits for good. And I hated my dad with a passion. I hated him with a passion. Had not called him dad since I was nine years of age. I won't go into the full story, but, but, uh, but the older I got, the worse I hated him. And finally, at age 20, when I got saved in that Volkswagen doodle bug, when I asked Christ into my heart and life, when I raised my head, all of that hatred was gone. All of that was swept away. I didn't have any bitterness. I didn't have any hatred. As a matter of fact, all of a sudden, I loved my daddy. Hadn't spoken to him. He hadn't asked me to forgive him. Nothing had changed on his end, but it had changed on within inside of me. And now, listen, I, that old song said, uh, I got that old time religion that makes me... Love everybody. That included my daddy. That was on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. On Wednesday morning, I drove over to Lucky Street in Atlanta. Salvation Army Rescue Mission. Knocked on the door. My dad came to the door. And for the first time since I was nine years of age, I called him daddy. I said, Dad, something happened to me yesterday, and I want to tell you about it. He said, well, come on in. We didn't have any Christians in my family except for grandmother and aunt and uncle, and that was it. Wasn't any other Christians at all in my family. Satan had come in and, 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 and taken my family and, and taken them down the drunkard's road and taken them down the divorce road and taken them down the uh, bitterness road and all the. I mean, listen, I've watched him just, just take my family and tear them apart. But I went to my daddy on that Wednesday and told him what had happened to me. And I said, Dad, would you go to church with me Sunday? And he said, I will. So Sunday night, we sat at the very back, back there. And during the invitation, I said to my daddy, I said, Daddy, would you go forward tonight? I'd like to see you get saved. He said, not tonight, son. Not tonight. It broke my heart. I don't want Satan to take my dad and carry him to hell. I don't want him to take my mom and carry her to hell. I don't want him to take my sister, my brothers, and, and, and my cousins. and aunt. I don't want him to take my family. And, 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 and so God being my helper, I want to do something. I, Lord, you said that we can resist him. And, I, and so I said to my dad, Dad, I'm so sad. I wish you would. Well, he didn't. Early Monday morning, the phone rang, and it was my dad. He said, you know what we talked about last night? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I couldn't sleep when I got home. 
He said, I got down beside my bunk and asked Jesus into my heart. And he was the first one in my family, then my brothers and my sister and eventually my mom and now cousins and aunts and uncles. And I mean, listen, I've watched, I've watched the devil be defeated in my family. I've watched him, I've watched him <laughs> lose his grip upon my family members. I've watched my family turn around and, and come up the right, the right road and, and be set free from sin and, and, and sorrow and all the other. But, but Because, listen, I'm telling you, uh, Satan, he's an enemy. He's an enemy, but he can be defeated. God, God help us to, to realize that. He can help every one of us if we surrender to him to impact our families and our jobs and our neighborhoods and our so, uh, you mentioned Brother David McCoy a while ago. I was thinking about, went up to preach for his daddy up in uh, Clemson, South Carolina. And his daddy had some professors in the, in the church from Clemson College. So I preached there, and, 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 and those professors had impacted the students in that college to where a lot of the football players were were there in the church. Matter of fact, after one of the services, they invited me to a fellowship, and, and, and so I went to the fellowship and, and did not realize that I was going to be among a bunch of football players, and I was like a little shrub among forest trees. I had to go over and get on a step so I could see, so I could see where I was. I mean, big, tall, burly fellows, and, 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 but those professors had impacted those those students, those football players, and they in turn had impacted their buddies and, and, and that college was, was, was full of born-again believers because, because Satan was defeated in that, in that college by born-again believers who'd say, I want to live for Christ. So he said, you take the shield of, uh, above all, taking the shield of faith, which you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Boy, God help us to realize we're not just a few little Christians who are helpless. Amen. We're God's people. And greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. Would you stand with us for prayer, please?